Via telephone, Senator Jason Barrett. Good morning, JB. Good morning, guys. How are you? Good, sir. Were you ever a scout in your youth? No, I wasn't. I was. That explains a lot. <laughs> We're ready getting started already, man. You know, real easy to do that on, when I'm on the phone, Joe. <laughs> so. Yeah, Delegate Mike Hornby will join us at 9.35 this morning. Uh, Jason, uh, a couple of things first and foremost. We had Senator Tarr on, the finance chairman, uh, earlier this week. Uh, in fact, yesterday. Yes. And I thought he did a really... A uh, good job in intricate detail about laying out why the Senate needs to take more time to consider this tax cut and why 50 percent probably isn't going to happen. The state can't afford it, he said, based on future obligations going out a few years. What are your thoughts? Well, I, as Senator Tarr does a great job as Senate Finance Chairman, and uh, he, he, you're right, he does articulate uh, the state's financial position uh, extremely well. And, you know, I think he's right when you look at, um, you know, some PEIA issues and, and other things moving forward um, of obligations that, that the state has. And we've heard um, uh, testimony and finance committee from uh, corrections that has $200 million in deferred maintenance. Uh, our higher education institutions have over $300 million in deferred maintenance. There, there are a lot of things uh, that are really, uh, and, and those things aren't base builders, but but they're expenses that are going to have to be addressed. And uh, and certainly there are some uh, base building um, that that moving forward that that could potentially put us in a in a financial problem moving forward. Um, you know, if we see a dip in severance collections, and you know, right now severance collections in West Virginia has always been extremely volatile. And right now we're at the top of the of the roller coaster ride with with extremely high severance collections, uh, and I think it's um, you know foolish to expect uh, us to stay at the top of the roller coaster uh, permanently. And so I think you have to be cautious. Uh, we want well, if we do tax cuts, well, when we do tax cuts, we want them to be permanent. We we don't want to go in and just slash taxes right now by these huge amounts. And then uh, in, in the next three or four fiscal years, uh, have a dip in severance, and then we have to figure out a way to, um, you know, to, to increase collections. And so we want, when we do a tax cut, we want it to be permanent. Billy, yeah. Uh, good morning, Jason. Uh, glad well, to, glad to talk to, talk with you again. Uh, I thought uh, Senator Tara made a couple of points yesterday that really resonated. One is. What is in the back end of the budget? I've been hearing from numerous ones of you over the last several weeks that we don't really worry about what's in the back end of the budget. We'll pay, we'll fund these if we have surplus left over. So there's not really a consequence. At least that's what I interpreted. Senator Tatar was saying just the opposite yesterday. He was saying these uh, things on the back end of the budget really need to be considered seriously and in some cases need to be moved to the front end of the budget, such as some of the uh, correction issues. Uh, I found that to be uh, uh, quite meaningful. Uh, the other thing he said that I thought was also significant, he said there, the governor has not submitted a six-year plan. Uh, they've asked for it, but they, they have not yet had a plan they can look uh, more than a couple of whole months ahead of time. Uh, so these couple together, uh, I thought I heard him say, or I think he did say, that 20 to 23 percent tax reduction was the most that you could expect. And one other quick thing I th he said is that we should look more at some structural changes, uh, such as marriage penalty uh, and, um, and raising the uh, uh, the 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 maximum rate we should look at these as well as just a pure tax reduction so i thought yesterday he gave one of the more thoughtful uh discussions that i've heard yeah and, and just to clarify bill on what you said there yeah. so there's no confusion senator tar wasn't saying raise the maximum tax rate for the pit he yeah. was talking about raising the income threshold exactly the right. maximum rate kicks in yeah thank you Rob. just so exactly nobody right. yes. has any confusions right. about that go ahead sure. jason well i, I think that Senator Tarr's point about uh, the surplus section of the budget that we commonly refer to as the back of the budget, and I spoke about it with you guys last week, is that the governor has put a lot of things in the surplus section of the budget that are actually base building things. Uh, for example, the teacher pay raise or, or the state employee pay raise, I should say. That's in the surplus section of the budget. It's our view, and I think it's been the, the common practice uh, of the legislature, is to put things in the back of the budget that are one-time expenses. 
Uh, then if you have a surplus, you're able to fund that. You don't put base building things in the surplus section of the budget. That's foolish because uh, it's, a, it's an expense that you're going to have to have every year moving forward. Why would you pay that with one-time money is, I think, the point that Senator Tarr was making, and he's absolutely correct. And, and so that's – Again, that's been what we've been dealing with here with this go- with the governor's budget right now of uh, of a four point eight billion dollar general revenue budget, but a billion dollars in the surplus section, and and so that's what we're trying to. And I've talked to you before about prioritizing some of our spending and and figuring out what we think is is important, what the people of West Virginia think is important. Uh, but the six year plan that they've given us revenue estimates for the next six years, but they haven't told us what they thought the expenses would be over the six years. And that's the part of the six-year plan that Senator Tarr is talking about that we've asked the governor's office numerous times, uh, uh, Secretary or Secretary Hardy, we've asked numerous times and just hasn't provided it. Joe. Uh, Senator, uh, another thing that Senator Tarr mentioned that kind of caught my ear was uh, references to uh, changes in the tax laws regarding equipment inventory and and uh, uh, the car tax and and the personal property tax issues that I thought w- were dead uh, with the defeat of Amendment Two and then the passage very quickly of the governor's proposal for tax reform by the House. Yet he is bringing that back up. Is that still a thing in the Senate? And is it possible? that a Senate package coming out will include tax reforms in, in the area of, of uh, personal property? Uh, I'm, everything is always still a thing, Joe. Um, I mean, I think that, that you know, we, we haven't um, – um, we haven't submitted a plan. We haven't passed a bill yet. Uh, we're still working through the process. So um, I, I, uh, I'm going to comment on what, what could or could not be in the plan. I think that, that we're working through the process. We're figuring out – we're prioritizing the spending – um, we're, we're running the numbers to see what kind of tax cut we can we can do, and then we're going to move forward with the tax cut. What are the odds that this is going to not get done right now by the end of the session? Because we, we just passed the halfway point, which I know still allows a lot of time for the Senate to get a, a package out there and sent back to the House. But I, I'm also hearing some concerns that it might not get done this session, even the governor spoke to that, and it might be a special session when this is, has, has to be wrapped up. Uh, you want to handicap that for us? Well, today is day 29, so tomorrow is the halfway point. Um, I, I mean, I, I fully expect us to get a tax cut done by the end of the session. Okay. Uh, so if you're betting on it, I'd bet on that side. Councilman Corey Roman. Jason, um, it's it's great to have you here. I haven't spoke to you in a while. Um, my question um, is a bit of a... Uh, a softball here um, and I want you to I want you to really hit it out of the park because I have a um, a lot of folks from the area listening um, when is tutors expected to <laughs> the, the, the real important question for it um, uh, actually we had some folks from leadership Jefferson here a week ago and uh, I got to speak to him and that was um, a top question of theirs as well so I appreciate the question uh, we're working hard you'll see that if you're if you travel on route 11 south uh, in South Berkeley County you'll see that we have walls up we should be set the trusses pretty soon so uh, I'm hoping uh, early uh, early spring early spring so we'll we'll cross our fingers but expect the summer right well, I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to be uh, around May or June. I'm just so. messing with you. I, 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 I uh, genuinely am excited, and um, congrats. I also want to Thanks. say um, I love seeing the pictures of, um, you know, Berkeley all over Facebook. Congrats. Well, he's the real star of the family. There's no question. <laughs> Do I send that advertising bill to yeah, you or say, the did summer he pay for that there, what? Jason? Where, where, who gets I that one? I request it, so. Well, that was a question. <laughs> hey, uh, let me ask you about Form Energy here, Jason. That's uh, gotten some controversial retorts from uh, Pat McGeehan in the House and some others as well. I understand that there's some work going on behind the scenes to convince people to vote against Form Energy out of some concerns about the Chinese involvement. Uh, That involvement has been disputed by Mitch Carmichael, uh, by the way. Uh, We're going to talk to a a delegate tomorrow from uh, that uh, area also, Delegate Willis, who's going to tell us why Form Energy is a good thing for the Weirton community and, and surrounding area. Where is Jason Barrett and any vibe from the Senate on Form Energy? Well, um, that started in the House. Um, I haven't uh, read all the way through the bill. I do know um, some of the parameters of, of the Form Energy deal. Um, 
Uh, they have to create 750 jobs. They have to invest $350 million of their own money before they uh, take ownership of the property. Uh, the state will own the property. Uh, but once those benchmarks are, are met by Form Energy, then they would uh, take ownership of it. Uh, and these, are, this is a deal not uh, unlike um, Nucor and some of the others, uh, with the exception that with this deal, Form Energy actually has more skin in the game. So um, I, I'm going to read the bill a little closer um, uh, once it comes over to the Senate. Um, I haven't, because it's a House bill, I've been dealing with uh, primarily uh, just Senate bills at this point, um, but I, I fully expect it to vet the bill and, and the project. But uh, everything that I've heard, um, you know, it sounds, sounds like a good project. And the Weirton Steel, um, you know, I believe that's 1,200 acres up there that is essentially being completely uh, unutilized. Um, so I think this would be a, a huge deal uh, for the Northern Panhandle. Billy, Jason, a couple of issues that were got a lot of um, uh, visibility before the session started. I've not heard anything about them subsequent to the session, but I'm sure you're working on them. DHHR and PEIA, what's the status of both? Well, DHHR, we are, we are working on, on DHHR's budget right now. Uh, and and I don't, I'm not talking about the dollar amounts uh, and all the line items, but what we're really looking to do is, is break down some of those line items. They have several line items in the budget that are, that are enormous dollar amounts. And so what I'm doing as the chair of the, uh, uh, the DHHR subcommittee is to break those down to add transparency so we have a better understanding of where uh, the money is being spent um, and then also uh, prevent a little uh, a bit of the flexibility that DHHR currently has with moving money around uh, from one either one hospital to another uh, or uh, different line items um, to, to just moving money around at their own discretion. Uh, we're going to limit some of that, and, and when they want to do that, they're going to have to ask for a supplemental appropriation. Uh, it wouldn't be an appropriation per se where, where there would be more state dollars spent, but it would be a supplemental that would allow them to transfer money from one account to another um, if we see fit. I, I think that there, with DHHR, there needs to be a lot more oversight. There needs to be a lot more transparency, and that's what this subcommittee is working uh, very hard to do. There have been a lot of talk about breaking DHHR in at least two or, or three uh, different departments. Is, are, are you involved in those, in those discussions? Yeah, it's the uh, Bureau of Health, um, Health Facilities, and Public Health, I believe, are the three agencies. I think I got the names right. Those are the three agencies that are that are going to uh, split off, and, and they'll uh, they'll be the three agencies uh, instead of just one as a DHHR. And that that will initiate in the Senate and then go to the House, or we already passed it out of the Senate. And the, I think the House has their own version, and uh, we're working on a. Uh, well, we actually passed that in the Senate on day one, uh, but we're, well, I think we're working on a compromise that the House passed their, their bill, and, and we passed ours, uh, like I said, on day one. So um, that's absolutely going to happen. Oh, so that was part of the uh, 15 to 16 bills that went across on day one. I, I, I think it was 20 couple, but, yeah, okay. we, we, we got in and started working right away and sent a bunch of bills to the House. So. Yesterday when we had uh, Senator Tarr on the finance chair, we asked him about the governor's private fund, which uh, of which th I guess $13 million was sent to Marshall University for the completion of their baseball stadium. He had some concerns about that expense and legality of it. Is it something the Senate is paying attention to, Jason, and do you have any similar concerns? Yeah, it's certainly something we're paying attention to, and I, I think that we're looking for some answers as to whether that was um, uh, legal to do. And, and I think it's very clear it wasn't the wisest decision uh, to use $10 million of, of CARES money, uh, and I'm not sure how much Senator Tarr outlined this, so I, I, don't want to, I don't want to tell you the exact same thing, but, but I, I want to give you a little bit of the backstory is that uh, Corrections was able to, to bill CARES uh, or get a reimbursement from CARES money uh, of $28 million uh, based on, uh, because of during COVID and the additional expenses that, that Corrections had. Uh, so when the state was reimbursed the $28 million from the CARES, the governor moved that into his uh, gifts, grants, and donations fund uh, that never had any real money in it in the past, but he transferred $28 million uh, into that, that account and then sent $10 million uh, to the Marshall baseball field, um, and there are still currently $18 million uh, uh, in that fund. 
The problem is that, you know, I think that that, should, that money should have stayed with corrections. We have the National Guard uh, working in our corrections facilities across the state because we don't pay people enough. We can't hire enough correction workers. Um, and we have $200 million in deferred maintenance at those facilities, and we send $10 million to a baseball field. Now, I'm sure Marshall, and I could completely agree that Marshall needs a state-of-the-art, top-of-the-line baseball field. I don't think that we should be spending that with money that goes to corrections. Um, so I think that's, you know, I, I, certainly I want the question to ask, uh, ask and answer on, on the legality of it, uh, uh, whether it's ethical or not, but it's clearly uh, not a good use of, of CARES money that was intended to be used at corrections. Jason, I, I, I echo your thoughts on that. I, I think it's somewhat of a questionable issue, and I think it warrants investigation in Charleston. The concern I had was in the Finance Committee, there were discussions about contacting the Inspector General's office for, this, for the United States Treasury to, to look into this. Isn't that a little bit dangerous to start running to D.C. to seek opinions about the legality of... Uh, of this use of the CARES money? Well, I mean, one of the things that we're concerned about is the clawback. And, and here we're going to pass the large tax cut. We have some of this base building spending. We have well, one-time spending. Um, and then if we get hit with large clawbacks from the federal government, that could create a real problem. And we need to know what those things, if there are going to be clawbacks, we need to be aware of it. Okay. And clawback is when the federal government takes money back because you spent it improperly. Well, I, I uh, just to give the governor's side of this, and, and again, I, I have my own concerns, but uh, the governor's spokesperson said that uh, uh, that they did get legal opinions about uh, the use of the, the repurposing of this CARES Act money, and that their attorneys uh, said it was okay to go ahead. That I assume the attorneys did their due diligence looking at the uh, federal legislation on this point. So that's the governor's side of it. But I, I just wonder, it, it, it's sometimes a little bit makes you queasy when you start having the Fed start snooping around about how we're spending money here in, uh, in West Virginia. Yeah, and I get that point, and the point's well taken. Um, uh, you know, I think if, if the CARES money and, and the, the administration in Washington, Congress in Washington, if they passed CARES, uh, the CARES Act and they were allowed, they, it's acceptable to use money for this purpose, um, I, then, then that's unacceptable out of the administration and out of Congress to do that. But what, what we do know, though, Jason, is that this divide between the governor and the Senate is perhaps growing <laughs> with this kind of invest. It's a in kind of inquiry taking place in Senate finance. Jason, let me ask Joe a very quick question. Uh, the legal uh, advice the governor got, uh, are you familiar with this this, uh, this the lawyers? The law firm, yes. Are they, yeah, are the they Bailey, very Bailey firm. Yeah. They're very credible? Oh, oh yeah. They're, okay. Yeah, they're, okay. No, they're... Uh, they oftentimes advise the governor's office about certain legal issues, and, and uh, they are now the governor's office is trumpeting the fact that they did get a legal opinion on this. Yeah. Jason, has there been any further progression on the bills that you personally are working on and sponsoring? I, I'm waiting. I was hoping uh, today that the locality pay bill would be up. Um, so I, I think that one, uh, we, we actually had the corrections. Uh, locality pay bill on the government organization committee agenda yesterday. I took it off the agenda uh, because I want to run uh, this larger locality pay bill first, um, and then if if that one cannot get across the finish line, then you know we're going to have some backup plans with um, locality for uh, for for individual agencies um, and specifically corrections. So when you say you're working on a larger locality, are you working on a bill that would cover all government employees in the Eastern Panhandle? Uh, yep. Well, all government employees anywhere, and, and what the bill is going to do is allow the discretion of of the agency uh, to do locality pay, and, and the, the bill mandates that they develop and implement a locality pay plan uh, by July 1, 2024. It would be interesting to see how each jurisdiction of the state comes up with a way of paying themselves more money. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. How much pushback are you getting? <laughs> They, the, their appropriation to their to their agency is done by the legislature, so they, they will have to show us that plan, um, and, and they'll have to implement a plan. But we will be we will be back here in legislative session before their plan is implemented, so that we can take a look at it. We can see uh, which agencies have done a really good job, uh, and, and which ones haven't, uh, and, and maybe those that haven't done a good job, we can steer them in the right direction. So you know, the legislature in, in several.
several of us have been trying to develop our own plan, um, and it's just um, really not workable to get it through the legislature. So I, I think it's, it's a, a pretty cool idea to get every agency to develop their own plan, and then we can figure out to see um, you know, who's come up with the best ones, and then, and then maybe we can get those other agencies to implement that. So uh, I, I think it's actually the, the best path forward uh, so that we can get locality pay uh, across, uh, across uh, all agencies uh, into the Eastern Panhandle. Well, we applaud your efforts. Uh, how much pushback are you getting? None right now. Well, that's encouraging. And uh, certificate of need, where are we halfway through the legislative session as of tomorrow with that? There is a bill that I believe um, Senator Maroney, who is the chair of the health committee and a doctor, uh, a bill that he is introducing, I don't know that it's in the system yet, that will allow, um, uh, that would essentially re- uh, repeal CON for on hospital campuses. And I think there may be an effort uh, to change uh, to change that a little bit uh, so that, that some of the folks that offer quality health care in our area uh, would, would, would also be able to offer some services. So um, I, I've introduced uh, some CON bills. I, I know there's been other folks that have, that have um, uh, introduced bills, but you know, the, the health committee chair is, is a doctor and you know, not overly excited about a complete repeal of CON. Uh, and so if there is a CON repeal, it is going to be extremely limited, I believe. When's crossover day, Jason? Hell if I know. Today's only 29. <laughs> uh, uh, I think it's day 47, Bill. 40, okay, fine. Yeah, I, 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 I'm lucky I know that today's Wednesday. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of work and extremely long days, so I'm lucky I know what day of the week it is. Final word is yours. Senator Barrett, what do you want to say? Um, that we are working through a, a lot of important bills uh, facing West Virginia. Uh, Senator Rucker and I and, and, and Senators Blair and Trump work extremely well together uh, here in Charleston. And so uh, we're doing the best job we can for the Eastern Panhandle. And, and I'm uh, very optimistic that we're going to be passing some legislation that uh, the people of the Eastern Panhandle will be proud of. Does that include tax cut legislation? Of course it does. JB, thank you very much for your time. 